Welcome to our discussion on the tangent line and velocity. First, we'll discuss the tangent line. If you're unfamiliar with what tangent means, it basically just means to touch a curve in exactly one and only one place. So you could think of something like, you know, if you have a circular object that is sitting on a horizontal flat surface, it's only going to be touching exactly one spot, right? So here's a, a figure showing you've got the circle and a straight line, and they intersect, they touch at just one point. Now when we get more advanced curves, it gets a little trickier, but the idea still holds as far as a tangent line will touch a curve really at any point at one and only one point. So you could think about rolling this ruler around this round object and it's still only going to touch it in one point at any given spot. Now since a tangent line is a straight line, let's see if we can come up with an equation of that straight line, you know, our good old y equals mx plus b, for it touching a curve at a given point. So in this case, we want to find a tangent line that is touching the parabola y equals x squared, and we're going to choose the point 1, 1. And you'll be able to see that we can find an equation of the tangent line as soon as we know its slope. But it's kind of difficult to find the slope at one point, right? Because the slope formula, we need two points to find slope. So that's kind of where we need to start. And then we need to kind of adjust from there. So you'll notice that if you have two points, right, point one, one, and then we pick some other arbitrary point on the curve, it's always going to be of the form x and x squared, right? Because every point is x, y. But since we're looking at the parabola where y equals x squared, every point just becomes x and x squared. Now, this blue line, which is kind of hard to see, is a secant line. So let's see if we can um, get a better picture of this. So here's an interactive picture of the same thing that we had before. And if we take this point, right, x, x squared, and take it much further away from this point, we can now see that those two lines separate, right? And this is what's called a secant line. A secant line just touches a curve in two places instead of one. Well, <clears throat> this would give us the slope between those two points. And you can see right now the slope is 3.3. But we don't want to know that. We want to know the slope exactly at this point. So let's bring the red dot closer to the blue dot and get a better estimate each time. Right? So we can bring it down the curve closer and closer and look what's happening to our slope. It's already at 3. And then it's getting smaller. 2.1. And as we get there, it's undefined. But just above it, it's 2 point something. If we go in the other direction, we can also see that is getting closer and closer to 2, right? 1.9, 2.1. So if we had to guess, what would we think the slope would be at that point? It seems pretty obvious that it should be 2. And in fact, that is what it is. If we look at the trend of what's happening with each of these points, right? So here's when our second point was 2, and then if we brought it closer and closer, back down to our stationary point of 1, 1, we can see the slope of that line goes from 3 down to 2.001 and if we went the other direction <clears throat> or I'm sorry if we got even closer and closer from the other direction you can see that it gets to that same very very close to 2. So we see that the limit as we approach 1 from both sides seems to exist and both of those limits seem to approach 2 so it seems pretty logical that we can just say the slope of that equation where we're trying to find the slope is going to equal 2. Now you might be asking yourself, what the heck is all this? Where is this coming from? Well, <clears throat> remember we're letting x get closer and closer to 1, and we're calculating the slope. And the slope is change in y over change in x. Well, since x can you know vary, we can't just put a 5 in here, because that would just be the slope between two points. We want to think of it as a function where this is x and this is y, but remember y we can write in the terms of x squared. So this is really just y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. This is slope. And we saw that the limit as we approach y, uh, sorry, as, as we approach 1, is going to equal 2. 
So that gives us our slope. So we can plug that into our slope, point slope form formula. Put two in for m, put in our point of one, one, right? For the y and the x, do a simple little simple math, and we get this is the equation of the tangent line at that point, one, one. Now, do you think it would be the same if we picked a different point between one, one? No, obviously not, right? As, as you move along the curve, that tangent is going to be a different steepness, right? Different slope. And you're going to be plugging a different point in for x and y, so you're going to get totally different equations for the tangent line at any particular point. We can see some more examples of secant lines going through our point P, and then the tangent lines going through those points as well. All right, what about velocity? Well, this is a very um, <clears throat> common problem in physics that involves the same kind of concept. And through experiments carried out a long time ago, Galileo discovered the distance fallen by any freely falling body is proportional to the square of the time it has been falling. Now, of course, this model um, doesn't take into account air resistance. So it's the idea that something should be falling like in a vacuum. Now, of course, we can't do that in real life. But usually for most objects, uh, over a small distance, the wind resistance isn't going to make a huge difference. Now, obviously, if you're dropping something like a feather that has a lot of wind resistance because it has a lot of surface area versus its um, weight, then that's going to mess things up. But if you're dropping you know, a pebble or a rock or things like that, they're going to have far less wind resistance as a ratio between that and its weight. So it's going to fall at that pre-prescribed idea so let's look at an example where a ball, right, something that's going to have really low wind resistance, is dropped from the observation deck of the CN Tower in Toronto, which is 450 meters above the ground. We want to find the velocity of the ball after five seconds. So we're looking for instantaneous velocity at five seconds, which is really difficult to, you know, just think of uh, calculating directly because it, it, there's no time, right? Instantaneous velocity means that it happened at five seconds, but there's no duration. There's no time interval. And we normally need a time interval in order to um, you know, calculate things because we need a difference of distance right, over a difference of time to get miles per hour or feet per second, things like that, because that's what an average is. But we want an instantaneous instead of an average. So you can think of before in those pictures, secant lines were giving you an average rate of change over an interval and then the tangent line gives you that instantaneous rate of change at a point. Okay so we can approximate this by computing the average velocity over these little tiny intervals just like we did with the tangent line and letting that interval get smaller and smaller and smaller. Now first we need to kind of formalize what the formula for distance is for a falling object. They talked about distance being something times time squared and blah, blah, blah. Well, this is the generic one, right? This is the general formula. Your distance is going to be one-half g times t squared, where g is the force of gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, um, and then t is your time. So if we do some simple math, put in the 9.8, hit it with 0.5, we get 4.9. t squared is going to be our formula for the position, basically the distance that it's fallen. So now we can figure out change in position over change in time, right? That's what an average is. That's what a slope is, change in y over change in x. So here is, we're basically looking at our s of 5.1 minus our s of 5. This would be if we're talking about s being the, the s function, right? So we're taking 5.1 and putting it into the function. We're just going to call it the function s. And then the time elapsed is 0.1 if we're going to 5 to 5.1, right? The difference between 5 and 5.1. Well, the function s basically just says square this thing, multiply it by 1 half g or 4.9. So here's my 4.9 times this squared minus 4.9 times this squared. Do a bunch of math and you get 49.49, really close to 49 and a half. But 
as those distances get smaller, right? So instead of between 5 and 5.1, we take a time interval of 0.05 and then a time interval of 0.01, and we're letting that interval get shorter and shorter, we can see that the number itself is trending closer and closer to 49. So just like before, it gives us a pretty obvious pattern that we know if we take the limit and we let that time interval go to zero, we're going to get an instantaneous speed of 49 meters per second. And that's it. That's that's the general idea of a tangent line and how it applies to this concept of instantaneous velocity. All right. Thanks for watching.